Now, when you were uh, hit, was it during the day or during the night? The night, we, because it was the only time we were out on patrol was during the night. Do the Germans usually fire at night? I, didn't they kind of... Oh, yes, they did. They, they had wonderful psychological, such as the screaming memes. Right. They fired 88s and they fired cannons. Um, and I can't think now what the other guns were that they fired. They had what was called a midnight check Charlie. Midnight check Charlie. And as we, before we had gone into combat, we found some 40 and 8 French empty railroad cars. Right. And we thought those would be wonderful to take our sleeping bags and sleep in those nice warm Empty box cars. Empty box cars. So the Germans had come along in their plane about 10 o'clock every night and they'd go right down through those row of cars and of course machine gun anyone that happened to be there. So that didn't work. Uh, life was full of surprises. If you had any life at all it was full of surprises. Right. Now one, one thing you said uh, about war uh, compared to the movies is that uh, a general can't get up and start ordering his men all along the beach to charge and go here and go there. You were telling me that uh, one aspect of war is it's extremely loud? Yes. One cannon being fired after another, uh, screaming memes, the 88s, and the other, all other kinds of guns, and they were used at night. Uh, they were they weren't used to really hit anything, particularly, but they were used to keep you from advancing. Right. Right. But, of course, that didn't work, and we had our casualties when we advanced, and I was one of them. Now, before uh, this happened, this was a t a, a, at a time when the Germans were using a tactic where they used uh, American-speaking Germans that was captured uniforms and captured supplies, and they would uh, they would try and uh, ambush and sabotage the American troops? Well, I heard about it, but we were moving so fast, and remember, we made no contact with any of the opposite uh, Germans at all. Never talked to one. I don't know that a German ever saw me, um, but we did see them when they surrendered and were taken uh, back to, to some detention. And they were they were a bunch of old men and young kids. Well, there weren't very many old men. I can tell you that. Uh, all of that's what the Germans started doing towards the end because all of their good fighters were gone. Right. Did so you? They were mostly, as I said, young children. Young children. Did you ever see a German tank? Um, or was a? It's too too. The train wasn't for them. Uh, no, we we knew where they were and we knew they were moving. But remember, once again, we were not allowed to fire on anything. Right. We weren't allowed to have our presence known. Uh, otherwise, the game would 
but it all get given away. So after you were hit uh, in this, uh, how how did you get back to your to the rear area with uh, with the wound? Well, that was probably one of the worst hardships of all. We were way deep in the depth, uh, the depth of the snow and the Ardennes Mountains. The Ardennes. So it was so ordered that uh, the biggest man there, and the sturdiest, uh, would simply have to carry me out. Well, they found out that right away that it was so cold that they didn't have to even use a tourniquet uh, above my wrist uh -huh. or arm. And tourniquets can be very, very dangerous because if not handled, handled appropriately, uh, they could cause gangrene and then you would lose your hand or arm or wherever the tourniquet was. Right. I was actually bleeding very little at the time, and I remember a man about six foot four. That was a big, big person in those days. Uh-huh. And he simply took me about 150 pounds worth and threw me like a sack of potatoes over his shoulder. Uh-huh. And he was carrying me through the snow and the storm for about three miles to get back to not a field hospital, but where uh, I could then be sent back. A, a collection area? Collection point for the wounded? Collection point is as good as anything. The, he would carry me so far, and then he'd say, John, you're going to have to walk a little bit. I can't go any further with this big load in this snow. Uh -huh. So I would go as far, walk as far as I could. It was like paddling uh, through a flour mill. And the snow was very deep. Uh, once again, extremely cold. At any rate, uh, we would exchange his carrying me to my walking and his guidance. And it took us, I can only guess, about three hours maybe, I don't really know, uh, to get to what you just called a collection point. This collection point had quite a few dugouts and they were all covered with bare trees. Bare trees. And I remember that there was no lights and as I crawled in to the dugout I'd hear one awful scream after another. The problem was there was no lights, you didn't know where you were, and you simply, they kept saying to you, go to the back of the group. Well, after all of the, of the moaning and groaning, uh, I finally got to the back of the group, and at that time, I don't think I was even given a shot, although we all carried morphine. A little sir, uh, a little uh, stirrette, or yes, you could, and you could actually, uh, if you got really a bad spot, you could take this little short needle syringe and inflict yourself with the morphine to cut down on the pain. I was so busy trying just to survive and keep moving one way or the other that I never used any of it until I got back to the collection point 
And then after an hour or two, two soldiers came along and virtually picked me up and put me into one of the old Dodge uh, paddle. Um, half tracks? No, they weren't half tracks really. Flatbed? Uh, oh yeah, they were good size. The roads by then were passable. And I was then set out to a town in England. But before that, uh, they hadn't operated on my hand or anything. They sent me to a vacated high school in the town of Luxembourg. Luxembourg. And I was there for about seven or eight hours, or maybe longer, I don't know. And that's what they did the first operating on my hand, which really amounted to just cleaning it out and wrapping it very good. How many operations did you have in uh, uh, years ahead to? 10 or 11. 10 or 11. Spent a good deal of my time in in, uh, in a hospital. Um, trying to think where in, in California, um, a wonderful place to be, uh, but I can't think of the name of it right now. It was very close to Stanford College. Stanford. Uh, I want to say Madigan General. I think Madigan Madigan's in Seattle. Is in, yeah, Tacoma. Is in Seattle. Uh, but this hospital, too, was very well known. And they had some of the finest hand surgeons in the world. Uh, otherwise, I would not have uh, a usable hand that I had all during those years. The hand now is deteriorated and uh, it's not near as usable as, as it used to be. But what does a man have to ask for if he's still alive at 84 and he can still get around? True. Well, I want to, sir, I want to thank you for your service to the country and thanks for being a great father and uh, this uh, this is going to go on YouTube and it's going to be a video record of one brave soldier's fight in our great war in the Battle of the Ordens, or it was called the Battle of the Bulge. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you very much, son. I'm glad that I'm still alive. I'm glad that I can tell you a little bit about what happened after, what, 50 years? 60 years? 60 years. 65 years. 65 years. Where did they go to?